Okay, so I'm gonna have to append this one to the video I did earlier today. Uh, this will just be one video. Um, in that video, I kind of ended it, I said that the Old Testament types aren't accurate. That's not what I meant. What I meant is that the Old Testament types with the scapegoat is not an accurate representation of the believer's fellowship with the Lord. It's a anti-type, meaning anti-types are a contrast. They are a contrast to the present situation. Um, they are a type showing a work that needs to be accomplished that's not yet been done. They point to the work of Christ, the perfect work of Christ. And according to Hebrews, there's been one offering already made. Um, and we are to come forward boldly to the throne of grace based on faith in that offering, knowing that we have access by faith into the holiest. And the the uh, offerings in the Old Testament, it, with the reminder of sin and the confession of sin, the scapegoat, all the different, the sin offerings, the trespass offering, every procedure related to that, all of it disappeared and was replaced with the one offering of Christ. Okay, none of those things are a type of anything that we're to do to maintain our fellowship. People say, people want to say, well, we're priests and we have an offering. Um, we, you know, we're, we're priests to make spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Um, yeah, we're a new holy priesthood according to a new uh, priesthood, not according to a carnal commandment, but according to the power of eternal life, which is maintained by Melchizedek within the veil, uh, in the holiest, after he sat down at the right hand of God, um, after the propitiation had been made, after he purified our sins, he entered into his heavenly ministry as the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, and there is a priesthood according to that order. And in that we are priests, and we do offer sacrifices that are acceptable to God according to Peter, in that we come forward to him who is the living stone, uh, rejected indeed of men, he is precious, and we as living stones are coming forward through faith in the blood to be built up in him to be the holy uh, priesthood offering acceptable sacrifices. And we, the, we are the sacrifice. We're living sacrifices. And we're the habitation of God in spirit. And what we're offering actually is the faith. Paul said in Philippians, even as I'm poured out, even if I'm poured out as a drink offering, on the sacrifice and the service of your faith. Faith is not believing that God's going to do something. Faith is a uh, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The works are finished from the foundation of the world, and that's why Hebrews talks about we who believed have entered into the rest because he who believes has ceased from his works as God has ceased from his. Uh, because the works are finished from the foundation of the world. And he's talking about the finished work of Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Um, that's a little deep. But the point is that there, the, the sacrifice we offer is the faith in a work that's already been done. It is not something present that we're doing. It's something that God's already done in Christ. And we are acknowledging it with our amen. We're saying yes to God's testimony. And remember the ark in the holiest, which is a picture of the humanity of Christ. Uh, it's a, made of acacia wood, which is his humanity. But it was lined within, painted on the inside with gold, which signifies his divine nature. The Father was in him. But then also on the outside, it was painted with gold. Um, and that signifies that he's been glorified. His humanity has also been covered with his divinity and his glorification. This is the ascended, resurrected Christ. And the, this is the propitiation seat. He's become the propitiation seat. He's become the ark. And in him is hidden any reference to sin or the broken law. He swallowed it up. Uh, and now the blood that is actually on him presented to God before the angels satisfies everything 
and testifies of his righteousness, which is now imputed to us. And that's our boldness, our access, our faith is in his finished work. And this is why we can come near. And we, that is our throne of grace. Um, the throne of the throne of judgment has become a throne of grace for us, and the place where we could not go before because there was a veil separating has now been manifested. The way into the holiest has been manifested. The veil has been taken of the way, and we are now brought into the presence of the glory of God with boldness, and we're priests according to a new order uh, of the ascended Christ after. All this preparation has been accomplished. The purification of sins has been accomplished. He sat down. He became the priest. And now we can come near through him. And he's called the apostle and the high priest of our profession. And we're to hold fast our profession and our confidence, which has great recompense of reward. And it's interesting, even in 1 John, he talks about our confidence and boldness at the judgment seat. He says, we write these things to you that you may have boldness in the day of judgment. And uh, now little children abide in him so that you may have confidence uh, in the day of Christ and not shrink back. And that's the same thing Hebrews is talking about. That there's a sin in Hebrews of shrinking back in unbelief into dead works represented by all the offerings under the old covenant and the old, all the sacrifices for sin, which just bring a reminder of sin. And could not perfect the worshipers, and by them they could not draw near. They had their sins on them. They could not draw near through those offerings. But in the new situation, with the new high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, who through his own flesh, the veil, has made a new and living way for us, we have boldness to come near. And when we do, we draw near with a heart in uh, full assurance of faith, having our conscience, our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our body washed with pure water. We're actually washed, coming forward to Him. Okay, uh, by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and it's in the purging of our conscience that we are drawing near. Um, conscience from the consciousness of sin. There's no sin consciousness in the holiest of all. There's no reference to sin. It's all done. It, there's only holiness in the holiest of all. And it's holiness in love. It's the love of God. And I did a message a, a while back when we were in Jude about when, uh, when I say holiness, do you think love? Because we don't. When we think of holiness, we think of the law and we think of the, the sin and we think of the consuming fire and we think of Sinai and we think of unapproachable light, and we, we fear. But there's a new atmosphere. Um, the voice of sonship, the spirit of the Son in our heart crying, Abba, Father, and this is now the source of holiness. And it is holy. We are holy. And when we come forward, we're washed. And we come forward with boldness without reference to sin. Now that's something that's hard for us to believe. Because our conscience condemns us the law condemns us our friends condemn us the world condemns us the devil condemns us and surely God must be condemning us too but that's not true if God is for us who can be against us if he didn't withhold his own son for us but gave him for us all how he would not with uh, how he, he shall he not freely give us all things and who is he that will lay a charge against God God's elect it is God who justifies and Christ who's risen from the dead who is our advocate interceding for us uh, Jesus Christ the righteous uh, our advocate with the Father who himself is the propitiation for our sins so um, hold on a second I hate this stupid exit doesn't make any sense okay uh, so now back to 1 John what this guy was saying to me was I think we should confess sins because that's how we get cleansed of unrighteousness and then he went on to say that uh, to be cleansed of unrighteousness is how we get particularly delivered from whatever sin we're dealing with now he's really young 
And he says, it works. For, it's worked for me. I get free from sin. Well, you don't know that yet. Give it 15 years. I thought I was cleansed of all kinds of sins too. And then they came back in force 10 years later. All that stuff is still in your flesh. And God get, may give you a respite. Okay? Uh, some grace. Because you can only deal with this stuff so much in ignorance. But eventually... He wants you to learn to walk according to the Spirit. Um, the, the Bible doesn't teach us to look for a supernatural deliverance from every kind of sin. Now, there are things that God delivers us from. I, I won't say that he doesn't deliver us from sin. But that's not primarily the way we're to look for freedom from sin's lordship. Um, there's some bondages where it's like, I, there's nothing I can do about this. Lord, you're going to have to deliver me. And he does. But even when he does, we need to be recognized that we are living dependent on his mercy. And if his, if his mercy was not there, I would go right back to that thing. It's not like my flesh is not capable of doing that anymore. It's not like that, that he has made some change in my flesh so that it no longer... That's not what the Bible says. The new man, my inner man, is created in the image of Christ, true righteousness and holiness, but I still live in the flesh, and the flesh in it dwells no good thing. Now, some people heretically teach that the flesh has changed and that it's no longer indwelt by the law of sin and that we no longer have that sin principle in us anymore, and that's not true at all. Paul says in Galatians that the flesh wars against the spirit. And we need to, and if you sow according to the flesh, if you sow to the flesh, you'll from the flesh reap corruption. And that's not just sowing to your sinful desires, that's sowing to law righteousness. He's talking about the religious flesh. If you sow to the religious flesh and seek to perfect the flesh by the law, you will so strengthen the flesh and you'll reap corruption. First, biting and devouring, envy, pride, strife, religious sins, heresies, uh, sex, factions, uh, divisions, witchcraft, manipulations, and, and, and emulations. But then adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness, and idolatry, and every evil thing will come as well. Why? Because you're walking in the flesh, and that's all the flesh is. So that's what Corinth was. I said Corinth and Galatia have the same problem. They're walking according to the flesh. And Corinth was just much more advanced in the expression of the flesh than Galatia was. Galatia was still in the early religious phases, whereas Corinth was having the full bloom of all the sinful stuff as well. They had people going to the massage parlors and to the temple prostitutes and the guy with his... Uh, father's wife and all that stuff but the root was the same it was the flesh and these are people who thought they'd been delivered from all that and be, had become spiritual now so it's dangerous this idea of what why we this is one of the reasons we teach against progressive sanctification this idea that you're getting holier and holier because it sets you up for a deception that somehow your flesh has changed and that's not what the scripture teaches what the scripture teaches is that we are to hold our flesh, our, we are to hold our vessel in honor by recognizing the truth of what the flesh is and how God dealt with it. And the blood is for the forgiveness of our sins and to give us access to God to qualify us so that we can come boldly to him at any time, no matter what our condition is. And it qualifies God to deal with us no matter what our condition is. God may be righteous and the uh, justifier of him who believes in Jesus, even though he's ungodly and he works not. To him who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. God is just and even righteous in, in dealing with us and even blessing us and giving us the spirit of sonship and the sense of blessing and dealing us with us as sons and heirs, even when the devil is able to say, look how wrong they are. doesn't matter. They're justified. They can come to me freely. And I can deal with them freely. I can work all things together for their good. I can bless them with my presence. 
And guess what? Without his presence, we have no way to deal with sin. But um, the, the blood is for bringing us into the fellowship, to give us access to God. But the cross is how God deals with sin, the power of sin. Uh, the sin in our members was condemned by Christ uh, what the law could not do and that it was weak through sinful flesh God did sending his own son in the likeness of the flesh of sin he condemned sin in Christ's flesh in the death that he died he died to sin once and for all his death is an effective death to sin he actually terminated its power and there is a killing power in the cross of Christ which was also offered up through the eternal spirit and we are by the spirit to put to death the deeds of the body now that's complicated and I'm not gonna I can't get into it all right now um, but we're to walk according to the spirit and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh because the killing power of the cross is in the spirit and the, 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 there's an acknowledgement of what the flesh is. To walk according to the Spirit has to do with the mindset on the Spirit and acknowledging the truth. And the truth has to do with a recognition of what God's judgment is on the flesh. The flesh, God is not expecting anything from it. And it comes to down to recognizing not only did we die to sin in the body of Christ in his death, we were baptized into his death and we died to sin, but we also have to see that we died to the law. So that we will stop sowing to the flesh. If we don't see that we died to the law, then we will try to perfect the flesh by law keeping and arouse, and sin will be aroused. Because the law is the strength of sin, and by the law are the motions of sin, according to Romans 7. And we had to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that we could be joined to another, even him who was raised from the dead, that is Christ, to bear fruit to God. And according to Paul in Galatians 2, um, I through the law died to the law that I might live unto God. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. Uh, and the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's a new life in me. But I have to see that I died with Christ and that I died to the law and there's no longer a demand on me. And the way we get free from sin's dominion Paul says, sin shall no longer lord it over you, for you are no longer under law, but under grace. And then he launches into his discussion of how we died to the law. Uh, Romans 6, 14, you are no longer under, uh, sin shall not lord it over you, for you are no, under, no more under law, but under grace. And then Romans 7 follows, which is our death to the law. Why? Because it's through the law that sin takes advantage and condemns us and puts us into debt and t basically practically takes us out of the presence of God by filling us with the spirit of bondage and fear and the sense of debt and make, makes us think we're wage slaves, thinking that we have to earn God's approval before we can come back to him. And we have to clean up our sins. We think we're in debt. Um, and so we stay in the flesh. Okay, so that's not my main point, though. Of, I, I, that's too deep to get into. But what I want to say is and stress is that cleansing you from unrighteousness is not the same thing as delivering you from sin. In 1 John 1, 9, when it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to uh, forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. To cleanse you from all unrighteousness was to qualify you to make you a son and an heir so that you could have access to God. It was to transfer you out of darkness and put you in the light. It was to give you the standing so that having been justified by faith, I now have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ and I have access by faith into this grace in which I stand. And the whole thing in 1 John is he's not teaching you how to fellowship and we taught on this extensively. He's telling you the difference between a believer and an antichrist. Uh, the, again, the, the, the antichrists in 1 John are the same people all the way through. They walk in darkness. The, they lie and the truth is not in them. They say they have no sin while boasting that they have fellowship with God. They say they love God while hating the brethren. 
they uh, say they know God, but they reject his testimony, and they don't recognize the children of God. They're of the world, and they don't hear the word of life. They're in darkness, and they've taken the way of Cain. They are like Cain, who was of the evil one, because he hated his brother. They hate the brethren the way Cain hated Abel. And it's specifically because they hate uh, the way that God justifies sinners through blood. Why was Abel justified? Because he offered uh, the first leg of the flock with the fat portion. He recognized that only blood satisfies the uh, sin situation and enables him to stand before God. Cain tried to offer from the fruit of the cursed ground. Cain, Cain's works represented his desire to be justified by works. And his hatred of Abel was over works righteousness, and it was a hatred for the gospel and a rejection of the testimony of Christ. Abel was a prophet, and he had the testimony of Christ, and he was the first martyr. And John is saying, we write these things concerning those who seduce you, they're robbing you of your joy. They're robbing you of your confidence. Uh, they're robbing you of your boldness. And they are not your brothers. They don't have eternal life. They're in darkness. The truth is not in them. And the problem is that when, when most pastors teach 1 John, they try to tell you it's a test to see if you're in the fellowship and to see if you're walking in love. Um, and and as, as if it's about your love and how are you loving and and they say that first John 1 9 is about you confessing your sins and if you don't confess your sins you're a liar and the truth is not in you and they say that the darkness is the sin that you have in you no John tells us what the darkness is the darkness is hating the brethren they stumble and they don't know where they go because the light is not in them. The truth is not in them. And it's because they hate the brethren. And that hatred is like Cain. You have to follow it all the way through. See, the problem is, is if you tell believers that 1 John 1, 9 is talking about them, then you have to tell them that when they are, uh, when they haven't confessed their sins, they're in the darkness. And then when they go home and read their Bible, and they go, okay, well then, if I'm in sin, then I'm in the darkness, and they follow that through the epistle, then they can't help but conclude that they're of the devil, and that they do not have eternal life. Okay? And the pastors try to say, oh no, well, it's not talking about that. When he's talking about darkness in other places, he's talking about something else. You know? Uh, they make a mess of the epistle, but anyone handling that epistle honestly with a sensitive conscience knows that the darkness in chapter 1 is the same as the darkness throughout the rest of the epistle. And if he's talking about you in 1 John 1, 9, then he's talking about you in 1 John 3. When he says, he who sins is of the devil, of the evil one. Uh, now the sin in, in 1 John 3 is, is not saying that if we sin, he says, you know, uh, if we sin, we're the evil one, but he who's born of God keeps himself and the devil doesn't touch him. And because he's born of God, his seed abides in him, he doesn't sin. We say, well, that means a born believer, born again believer can't sin. Oh, and my regenerated spirit doesn't sin. And we try to make a complicated doctrine out of that. But what he's talking about is the sin of Cain, who, who was of the evil one. He says it right there in the chapter. And why was he the evil one? He, because he was he killed Abel, he hated Abel, and no one who hates his brother has eternal life in him. Um, and the reason he hated him was because his deeds were righteous. And what deeds were those? He offered the blood. Jesus Christ the righteous is the propitiation for our sins. And the practice of righteousness in 1 John is to believe in God's testimony concerning his son, which was Abel's practice of righteousness. Now, he did write it in code because he's writing it to a church that's full of antichrists and diatrophies and people like that are kicking people out of the church. They're getting offended, kicking people out of the church. And during a dangerous time, during Nero's persecution, 
And so to protect the sheep, he wrote in code so that the it would not be obvious that he was talking about the Antichrist in their midst. Um, the Antichrist would read it, and, and unless you knew why Abel was justified, you wouldn't understand what the practice of righteousness is. You would think it's law righteousness. And most, how do I know that? Because that's how Lord Chippers teach, and most pastors teach, about the practice of righteousness in 1 John. They think it means commandment keeping and law keeping. So that so a, a, a Lord Chipper or a Judaizer reading that would say, see, finally, he's talking some sense. Unless you practice righteousness, you're of the devil. Well, but someone who understands the gospel and understands why Abel was justified would go, no, these people are not of God. And, and he's telling us secretly. Because the other thing about Lord Chippers and, and most pastors who are um, justified by works, most of them, not all of them. If you ask a pastor why was Cain rejected of God, they will tell you, because he didn't give his best. He didn't work hard enough. Abel offered the firstling of the flock. Cain probably didn't offer the best of the fruit of the ground. He didn't give him his best. He must have withheld something of his own. Why do they say that? Because they don't, they miss the point that Abel became a shepherd because he had a vision that Adam and Eve were covered with the skins from an animal that God slayed and they didn't die when God said they would an animal was substituted in their place and that was their righteousness and he became a shepherd to offer the first leg of the flock it says with the fat portion and he began the practice of the burnt offering right there at the gate of Eden and Jesus grouped him in with the prophets he had the testimony of Jesus Christ the prophets testified concerning the sufferings of the Christ and the glories to follow he knew um, and Cain rejected that testimony. Cain was trying to be justified by works, just like most of the pastors who tell you that the reason Cain was rejected was because he didn't work hard enough. And so, of course, the Lordshippers and the Judaizers reading that epistle, when John talks about the practice of righteousness, are going to assume he's exonerating them and not be offended. But someone who understands the gospel and realizes that 1 John is all centered around Cain and Abel is going to realize that he's who he's talking about. And that's why I did that book, 1 John Decoded, Exposing the Antichrist Right Under Their Noses. And that's exactly what he was doing. But anyway, when he talks about confessing sin, he's comparing antichrists who deny that they have sin with the fundamental confession that a believer makes when he transfers from darkness to light that he has sin but he also confesses that he has an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous who himself is the propitiation for his sins he is not advocating a practice of confessing your sin in order to to maintain your fellowship with God. That's not, that John doesn't give any kind of indication that this is a practice that you have to have in order to have fellowship with God. No, the fellowship with God is by walking in the light. He says if we walk in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of our sin. And the pastors will say to walk in the light means you don't have sin. No, to walk in the light means that you actually believe the testimony. The light is shining from the testimony. You don't reject it, but you believe and acknowledge it. That's what makes us in the light. We don't deny the truth. No, you have sin and, you, and you're not confessing it, and that's why you're in the darkness. No, that's not what he says. The light is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in the word it's the fellowship in the word with these things we write to you that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with this son jesus christ and in the fellowship there's a cleansing flow which is the river the water of life that proceeds from the uh, throne of god and of the lamb it's just there if you walk in the light you will be you will have a cleansing flow 
And to walk in the light is to walk in the spirit, is to set your mind on the things of the spirit, and it also deals with the flesh. Not by a deliverance from this sin and that sin, but if every every day we need to walk according to the spirit. We can sow to the flesh and we can sow to the spirit. We can mind things of the flesh and we can mind things of the spirit. Now, that sounds like I'm saying be spiritual and think about holy things. Don't think about the world. Don't think about sinful things. Think about godly things. But that's not it. What it is is we grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We grow in the knowledge of the truth, specifically our acceptance before God. Growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and minding the things of the Spirit is becoming, is, is, as, as we've been discussing in Hebrews and when we talk about Romans 8, is being led by the Spirit into the atmosphere of sonship so that we become increasingly acquainted with the Spirit that bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God and heirs and less and less at home with the Spirit of bondage and fear. Right? For as many as are children of God are led of the Spirit of God, for you not received a spirit of bondage again into fear, but a spirit of sonship in which you cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God and heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. It's a totally di different atmosphere of no condemnation and freedom to approach God boldly and joy and acceptance in the Beloved. Uh, it's the atmosphere of Zion. It's this new atmosphere of God speaking in the holiest. And that's what we've been talking about in Hebrews, which we'll be getting back to. Uh, that there is a new atmosphere of God speaking in the Son. It, that, that is the speaking of God in the face of Jesus Christ, the radiance of his glory, the ascended, glorified, enthroned Christ, who has now become our high priest, and can communicate himself directly through his humanity to us. And he's got a smile on his face. It's a new kind of speaking and a new kind of atmosphere. And to walk according to the Spirit and to set our mind according to the Spirit is just to become increasingly familiar that there's no condemnation and, and it's a rest that grows so that we are not fearful anymore and hanging back but we're coming forward boldly okay now i need to find this place where i'm supposed to play this music uh have a good evening